I discovered this week, people like when I share stats and studies, here's one you won't like. Studies show that we spend on average five years of our entire lives waiting. Five years, 24-7, waiting. I don't know about you, but I hate waiting. I think ranking up there with one of the things I hate waiting the most for is parking. <laughs> Maybe you haven't had it, but in my BC days, you know, I had it yesterday. You had it yesterday, yeah. <laughs> more, Lord, more. <laughs> Yeah, you, know, you get to that parking spot, and they, they see that you're waiting while they unpack all the groceries. Oh, yes. And they take their time. And they take their time, yeah. Got a brother in arms. <laughs> and then they climb in the car, and I don't know, maybe they check email, you know, respond to that <laughs> job offer, notify their husband. Oh, now I said what gender. Notify. Uh, <laughs> And she puts it in reverse. The lights are white, but the car's not moving. And you miss four or five parking spots because, you know, you're indicating here, yeah, and that dog gets that one, you know. And then they wind down the window, I'm not leaving. <laughs> yeah, or you go to that restaurant, table for two, please. Did you, did you book? Have you made a reservation? Ah. But like, it's empty, you know? Yes, but that one's reserved for next week, Wednesday, six o'clock, so we just don't, yeah. <laughs> Uber Eats is kind of up there at the moment. You know, you order from two different places, the one arrives 10 minutes later, the other one, you know, you're in bed, and my wife is at the gate. <laughs> Thank you for the food, yeah. <laughs> I don't know what WhatsApp are thinking. Typing. Hey, babes, I'm at the shops. Is there anything you need me to get for you? Send, receive, blue tick, Typing. Okay. Still typing. <laughs> Let me go and get the trolley because clearly it's a long list. So I get the, you know, and you're standing there. It's like, okay, I'm ready. Typing. And then, boop, gone. No message. I'm like, <laughs> it's like, I am highly medicated and this is why. <laughs> All my favorite raw preachers and absolute cracker. We're crying. The presence of God is here. I get up to host and close the meeting. And someone can't wait for me to finish praying. They're ducking out because they don't want to wait in line. Yeah. And it normally happens from this group over here. <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. Yeah. Yeah, yeah. And it's not even, it's not a, we're sneaking out. <laughs> It's dragging little Johnny, and he brought drums to church in the backpack. He's like, who's it going to be today? I'll make sure Kai prays a long, loud prayer. Brilliant. Yeah. Because we hate waiting. Can't even wait for an amen. So we're doing a series called Teach Us to Pray, and today I want to, if there's a title to my sermon, it's Teach Us to Wait. Wow. Teach Us to Wait. So grab your Bible, get to Isaiah chapter 64, I'll wait. <laughs> it's a little bit of a fine print, I'm not going to answer all your questions. This is not going to be a theological thesis, this is just a guy on his knees waiting. He wants to show you a thing or two that I've learned over the years. Isaiah 64. If you're not there, and if you don't have a Bible, why? I'll put it up on the screen because I want you to see this. Isaiah 64, verse 4 says, Since the world began, no ear has heard and no eye has seen a God like you who works for those who wait for him. What a verse. What a God. Since the world began, no ear has heard and no eye has seen a God like the one we call Father who works for those who wait for him. Some translations say who acts on behalf of, who intercedes on behalf of those who wait for him. This is why 
we need to say, Lord, would you teach us to wait? Because if we get this, what we get in return is a God who works on our behalf. A God who works for those who wait. If you have your Bible, right in the, in, next to verse 4, 2 Chronicles 20, and then head on over there. While you're paging there, the, the backstory to 2 Chronicles 20, there's a king by the name of Jehoshaphat, and the enemies are amassing on their shores. It talks about the Moabites and Ammonites and Meonites. They've, they've all gathered against the nation of Judah. If you know your Bible history, there are 12 tribes of Israel, 10 of them, went the other way, and they've already been taken off by hoarding masses. And now you've just got these last two tribes of Judah and Benjamin and Jerusalem. It's the least of these. And three nations have now amassed. And it says in verse 2, some people came and told Jehoshaphat, a vast army is coming against you from Edom, from the other side of the Dead Sea. It's already in Hazizan and Tamar, that is in Gedi, that is less than 40 kilometers away. Alarmed, Jehoshaphat called on the mighty men, gathered his troops, sent money to Egypt to get armies. No. Alarmed, Jehoshaphat resolved to inquire of the Lord. I don't know if it was you, a threat of your life, what you would do. I'd spring into action. Jehoshaphat springs into waiting on the Lord. It says in verse 4, the people of Judah came together to seek help from the Lord. They came from every town in Judah to seek him. So here you've got a king who knows that since the beginning of the world, no ear has heard, no eye has seen a God who works for those who wait. The king seems to know this. The people seem to know this. They gather from all the cities across Judah to come and wait on God. And so the king now prays. And he says, listen, we're not here just out of happenstance. This has been taught to us by our forefathers. It actually says in verse 8, they built a sanctuary for your name, saying this is what our forefathers did for us. It says they built the sanctuary and they said, if calamity comes upon us, whether the sword of judgment or plague or famine, we will stand in your presence before this temple that bears your name and we will cry out to you in our distress and you will hear us and you will save us because you are a God who works for those who wait. And then verse 12, one of my favorite verses in the Bible. (coughs) For we have no power to face this vast army that is attacking us. We don't know what to do, but our eyes are on you. What a God. What an example. We have no power to face this vast army. What vast army are you facing? Maybe it's finances. Maybe you've been stuck in a hole. Maybe you just haven't recovered since COVID. The side hustle is dying. You haven't had a raise, inflation, petrol price, all of that. And now you're hemorrhaging finances. What is your vast army? Maybe it's health. Had a friend a few weeks ago. The doctor didn't quite know how to tell them the news. And so awkwardly said, I think you need to work on your bucket list. What is the vast army? It says there, we have no power to face this vast army. Maybe it's those in your workplace that have risen up against you. Maybe it's a spouse. Maybe it's that you're single. From time to time, I help out with the AV team, which means that I stand at the back there. And I've watched, ongoingly, a husband and wife and their family come to church on a Sunday And she stands in radiant worship of her heavenly father. And he sits. Calls himself a Christian. But he won't stand and worship this God. He'll he'll sit there. Sometimes on his phone. And I've watched the ache. It's tangible. Because when she brings her kids, her, her kids stand and they're teenagers. And her son is from time to time looking at her husband. Like... Is it okay if I stand and worship? You know, am I going to get moaned at by dad? Am I caught? What is that vast army? I have no power. We don't know what to do, but our eyes are on you. We don't know what to do. This is unprecedented. 
This is the end of me, the end of my career, maybe end of my marriage, end of my finances. Lord, we don't know what to do, but our eyes are on you. Because since the world began, no eye has seen, no ear has heard a God like the God that we serve, a God who works for those who wait. You know, and I realize you can, you can pick a page. Pick a page in your Bible. <laughs> yeah? Start right at the very beginning, Joseph, Moses, Joshua, page through to Ruth and Esther and Daniel and David and Paul and Peter. What do you find there? Our saints, sons and daughters of God are saying, I don't know what to do, but my eyes are on you. And you hear on those same pages the whispers of God's word since the world began. No eye has seen, no ear has heard of a God like me who works while you wait. You can pick a page, you can pick a person. Sabrina, Annie, Dennis, Raw Hilton, Kath, Kai, Verna, Charmaine. Pick a person. I guarantee you there's been a moment, and it might even be today, where you are saying, I don't know what to do, but my eyes are on you. To which I ask you, have you heard the whispers of God? Mm. He says, I will work while you wait. Mm. Yeah. What does that look like? It's very easy to say. Andrew Murray says it like this. He says, the whole relationship of all creation to its creator is this. A continuous, universal dependence on him. Therefore, the place and nature of man is nothing but this to wait upon God and receive from him what he alone can give. <laughs> the whole relationship of all of creation to its creator is to wait upon God and receive from him what he alone can give. But man, do I hate waiting. I wonder what the statistics would show if we had to find out from those who drift from God, who leave church, deny their faith, I wonder how much of that revolves around waiting. So what does it look like to wait on God? I want to just pick up one psalm, because we can, we can spend weeks on this. And this is Psalm 27. If you have your Bible, hop on over to Psalm 27. I've been in there so much, my Bible actually flips open to Psalm 27 at the moment. It's, it's known as a war psalm, because he uses words like, the wicked advance against me. In the day of trouble, my enemies surround me. But it's also a smear campaign. <laughs> David is saying things like, they are false witnesses. They are spewing malicious accusations. They have literally declared war against me with their words. So that's Psalm 27. Yeah, don't read it on a Monday. <laughs> Maybe read it on a Monday. Because the very last verse, Psalm 27, 14, is like he's built this entire monstrosity, and it lands on one verse. Psalm 27, 14 says, Wait upon the Lord. Be strong and take heart and wait upon the Lord. Now, what does it mean to wait on the Lord? That, that word in the Hebrew is kavar. It's, it's the word that's always translated into, for us, wait but the beautiful thing about Hebrew is it's an incredibly colorful, rich, textured language, and, and weight is so two-dimensional. Kavar, it can mean and does mean to wait, but it waits. It, it, it means to wait where you sort of like, if I were to grab hold of real as he's, as he's walking out the door, because it means to tie together with twisting. That's waiting. To entwine inseparably together, or to wrap Tightly. See, waiting is not let go and let God. Waiting is grabbing a hold of God to entwine your heart with His. I think this is why Jesus starts when He says, listen, this is how you should pray. Begin with our Father. Entwine your heart with your Father. Entwine your heart with His purposes, with His plans, with His promises. What has He spoken over that situation? Entwine your heart. Wait upon the Lord. Be strong and take heart. Wait. And that middle portion there, it's, it's, a, it's quite a quaint Hebrew phrase to take heart and to be strong and courageous. It, it, it can mean, you know, be alert, be brave, be courageous. 
But it's also got this element of fortifying your heart, of making your feet firmly secure. See, we're not just waiting passively, you know, God will do. It's look, we are grounding and entwining ourselves into the heart of the Father. And one, one translation actually says, harden your heart, which is weird. Because normally harden, you, know, you harden your heart against what God wants to do. But this is a picture of hardening your heart, like cementing your heart to his heart. Be entwined with your God who moves for those who wait. Who works and acts and intervenes on behalf of those who wait. And it's an absolutely incredible picture. Because if you get this, if you get this, actually what I found over the last few days in studying this portion of Scripture, it's like God has shown me some kind of a delight in the wait. Yeah. I think if we get this, there will be such a delight in the wait that the answer will become secondary. Yeah, you know, if you've ever met someone who's gone through some stuff, lost everything or came close to death, you, know, you chat to them and you ask them like, Phew. you know, would you ever... I suppose you hope you'd never go through that again. The answer is yes. I really hope I would never have to encounter that again. But I'm so glad I did. Because in waiting on the Lord, He entwines His heart to you. He deals, He exposes with insecurities and fears and doubts. He uses the time to peel back some layers so that you can actually know what you believe. Just how much do I trust that this God can heal my sick daughter? He'll push all those buttons and slowly carve away all of that which is of you and replace it with that which is of his heart. And it is profound because we run from it, because we hate it, because it hurts and it's terrifying. To actually encounter what is it that you genuinely believe? Is he really who he say, says he is? Do you believe that he is who he says he is? And so David ends it. I think he's talking to himself. Wait for the Lord. Be strong and take heart and wait for the Lord. A few years ago... I had the privilege of almost losing my business and going through <laughs> hellfire. And the problem was we had just done so well. The year before that, I'd done all the um, TV ads for the Rugby World Cup for ABSA. I was the voice of BMW and <laughs> Samsung. <laughs> you can't afford me, Rory. <laughs> <laughs> Anything else? <laughs> so we were, we were printing money. We were living large. So much so that we decided now's a good time to try to have kids. Kath was pregnant. Well, sorry, Noah was born. And so we were sort of working her out of needing to work. And then I lost my anchor client. Ew. Couldn't afford you. <laughs> <laughs> Sniper four, sniper four, if we could. Um... And we went from printing money to, I don't even think we were making 20% of budget. <clears throat> but I'm a man of God. Got my theology degree. And I would call myself a radical intercessor. So I did what came naturally. I just worked twice as hard. <laughs> <clears throat> I started an hour earlier, I worked through my lunch breaks, and I finished an hour later, and I worked part-time on Saturdays, because this thing wasn't going to finish me, this vast army. And I decided that I would put together a proposal for a new client and a new idea once every week, and not one of those proposals were accepted. Actually, it went the other way. I, remember, I just remembered this morning, there was one client we had finally, there's, there's like nice, one little bit of good work that came through. And right at the very end, they said, listen, can you just put a statement together of, you know, of, of all the bits and pieces? And so I emailed that through, and they paid for that entire statement. It was like double paid. I'd already been paid for everything, all the bits and pieces. I sent it through to her, and five minutes later, I get paid, double paid. And I'm sitting there like, oh, what do I do? She made a mistake. No one would know. 
So I asked them for their bank details, and I paid the money back. And she's like, oh, that's so weird. We wouldn't have noticed it. I'm like, don't tell me that. <laughs> Days became weeks, and weeks became months, and months became more than a year. And you're like, Lord, where are you? <laughs> I was on my knees repenting of sins that, you know, that, that pencil that I stole from my friend when I was three. <laughs> <laughs> And I remember I didn't return that toy, and I broke my mom's mug, and like, Lord, it's like anything. What do I, what's the formula? How can I get through? Just don't make me wait. How can I short circuit this thing? And then, remarkably, supernaturally, I got an email from a client. A lot of the time, I never actually met the clients. You know, if you were doing work for East Coast Radio or Seminar 2 or even OFM, you get an email, this is the job, this is the, the brief, you finish the project, send it off, and you get paid. And the one lady, well, I remember it was about 3 o'clock on a Friday afternoon. I get this email, and it's a very awkward email. She's saying to me, listen, I, I don't quite know how to say this, but I'm a Christian, so she, didn't, she hadn't met me. She didn't know I was a Christian. But she's saying, I'm a Christian, and I believe that my God speaks to me, and he's been speaking to me about you. And then she wrote a paragraph, word for word, of what we were going through. It was frightening. And right at the very end was the promise. Wait on the Lord. He works for those who wait. He'll come through for you. You are of the head and not the tail. Just receive shabababa filled. I'm like, yes. We're eating a spur tonight. It's going big. <laughs> but not just that. Monday, my mom phones me. She says, my boy... You won't believe this, but Barbara, which is her best friend and down in Durban, was at church this Sunday. And Barbara had gone, and, and the pastor, before he started preaching, he said, hey, listen, I, I just I feel that I have a word for someone here. Is there a Stephen? Can, can I see a Stephen? Wow. No one. And that's really bad for a pastor. No. Yeah. No. <laughs> Prophetic word. I see clearly. Yeah. Uh, Stevenson? <laughs> yeah. <laughs> yeah. He's like, uh, anyone here married to a Stephen? And he's at home. Not a hand. You got a son named Stephen, please. Yeah. And out of exasperation, he says, Did anyone know any Stephen at all? Barbara puts up her hand. My friend's son, Stephen. Paragraph. Exactly. Word for word what we were going through. And it ended. The Lord works for those who wait. Like, we're going big tonight. Got a prophetic word. It's been confirmed. And it was almost eight months later. Where we're on the brink of losing everything, huh? I mean, like properly. We do, like worst case scenario, move in with your mother-in-law bad. I know. Help me, Jesus. That's when you test it on what you really believe. You know? <laughs> God, are you really good? <laughs> Actually, I've gotten to the point where I despise those two prophetic words. Because those two prophetic words changed from working to waiting. And I hate waiting. Answer me now. Do you realize, Lord? But we read here. That to wait is to entwine your heart with the heart of the Father. Be strong and courageous. Allow Him to circumcise your heart and in its place graft you into His heart. And when you get that, when you understand that, you will know that it is worth the wait. Because what happened at the very end of that year, somehow, and I can't explain why, I just knew that I knew that I knew that I was called to full-time ministry. I never wanted anything to do with it. My grandparents were missionaries. I'd seen the dark side of missionary work. My, my father had stepped in to help with a, a church that was imploding. I'd seen the very dark side of that. Plus, I wanted to be rich. <laughs> and God said, I've called you to ministry. Now, that entwining of my heart with his bears fruit. Yeah. See, what the world does, when you're facing this, there are two things on offer. The one, I don't know if you remember it, I, I suppose I remember it because of my advertising background, but there was a credit card called Access. 
I don't know if you remember that credit card slogan. Take the weight out of wanting. Yeah. And you're offered that when you wait. To fix it. Do something. And on the other hand, there's this whisper. Since the foundation of the world was established, no eye has seen, no ear has heard, a God stands ready to work if you will just wait. I close with this. So if you want to leave, now's a good time. (laughs) 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 What God did in my heart back there is the reason why I'm standing here today. And he had to get me out of a very cautious, very caged place Mm. to trust him. And that's what he does in the waiting. I don't know if you've seen the movie Madagascar. It's a true story. (laughs) (laughs) Must watch it, it will change your life. (laughs) I I, I was reflecting on it. So the opening scene, for those who haven't watched it, is Marty the zebra is running in the wild, but it turns out he's not actually in the wild. He's in a cage, and he's got this wall painted with nature, and he's on a treadmill, but he just wants to be in the wild. And at the end of the day, it's his birthday. I think he's turning 10 or something like that. And so all the animals gather around. They wish him happy birthday. And then, of course, he has to blow out the candle and make a wish. And they're like, what did you wish for? I wish that I could be in the wild. And they're all like, whoa, hey, time out, bud. Alex the lion is saying, listen, why would you want to be in the wild? You know, they feed us every day. (laughs) Plus, if I roar, you know, it's like we get the applause. And I think the giraffe's name was Melman or something like that. Yeah. He's like, no, but I get all my medication, and, and if I get an owie, you know, they'll put a plus on me, and they'll love and care for me. And in prepping, I realized, that's us. Christians love cages. You know, give us enough time, and we'll distill a relationship with the God of all creation down to, well, I might come on Sunday, and they can feed me. I might roar at last group, and I get a pat on the back, and we do that over and over and over again. But what I found during this prayer series is that God has begun to awaken a call to the wild in me. Surely this can't be it. For you and I, surely this can't be cloistered up on a Sunday. Surely God has more for us. Surely there's a call. There's a whisper. Do you not know 3CR? Since the foundation of the world, no ear has heard, no eye has seen a God who works for those who wait. And so my charge, and I close with this, would you come out of your cage, get on your knees, and begin to wait again, and watch what God does with your dark places. Watch what He does with your workplaces. Look what he does and watch as you wait what he does with the dissonance and the destruction that surrounds you. And watch as he works on your behalf and deals with the advancing armies in your life. In Jesus' name.